to introduce our new U.S. Ambassador to Poland. His name is Mark Brzezinski, and I have the pleasure of working with his brother, Ian Brzezinski, who's also at the Atlantic Council. But I just found out that there's a third Brzezinski. His name is Ambassador Teddy, and he's on Twitter. So this is a new form of, of uh, diplomacy on Twitter, and I love it. I'd also like to thank my distinguished panelists. You're really in for a treat. We flew someone in from Ukraine, and we have two distinguished uh, experts from Poland as well. And Deputy Prime Minister Shadach will be joining us as well at the end. Thank you to Marta Poslad and Google for today's venue. It's really beautiful, and it's an honor to be here. As thrilled as we are to be hosting this event live from Warsaw, this discussion marks a somber moment for Ukraine, Europe, and the West. With his actions, Vladimir Putin has brought war and conflict to Europe once again. What does Vladimir Putin want? He wants four things. He wants to destroy the westernizing drive in Ukraine. He wants to tear NATO apart. He wants to humiliate the United States and the West. And he wants to rewrite the rules of the European security architecture. The big question is, are we going to let him? The Kremlin's actions may spark a refugee crisis in Europe. It may spark a world war, and it may, uh, it may spark greater unrest in the South China Sea. We cannot sit idly by. At the Atlantic Council, we believe that a rules-based international system creates more security and a more prosperous world. The mission of the Atlantic Council, shaping the global future together, is more critical now than ever before, and we're intensifying our cooperation with partners in Europe, and that's why we're here today. We're also doubling down on Poland, and I'm so happy to tell you that we will soon be hiring a Warsaw-based director and relaunching our Warsaw office. So you will see more of us very, very soon. Let's go back to Russia for a minute. We can't ignore Vladimir Putin's aggressive actions in Ukraine and Europe. Yesterday, the Biden administration imposed new sanctions and declared that this is indeed a Russian invasion of Ukraine. But let me point out, they've been at this. This is not Putin's first rodeo in Ukraine. He's been at this since 2014. Germany finally did the right thing yesterday, and they paused the Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline. Thank the Lord. These are many of the tough actions the West will take if Russia continues to escalate. As we get closer to killing Nord Stream 2, we should not forget about the importance of diversifying our energy dependence, and our Central European partners must play a leading role in that development, including through the Three Seas Initiative. I will close by simply stating, today, Vladimir Putin stands alone. We stand together, 30 members from NATO, 27 members of the European Union, partners in Europe, the United States, and around the globe in support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We are united, and we will remain united. Now, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Mark Brzezinski to the stage. He's not new to Poland. He's a long-term friend of Poland and Central Europe, and you guys are very, very lucky to have him. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Melinda. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome this opportunity to participate in this vital discussion today regarding strengthening the transatlantic response to Russian aggression. I applaud the Atlantic Council for organizing this panel. I love the Atlantic Council. I know it well. If anything, this is the Atlantic Council's finest hour because with Fred and Damon and everyone else at the Atlantic Council, they have stood for peace and freedom across the European and Eurasian landmass. And that is under threat today. I have to just say thank you to a few people here. I want to point out very briefly that Rafał Milczarski, the CEO of Lot Polish Airlines, has been just an incredibly effective and valued partner to the American interest in Poland, particularly at this time. We thank you, Rafał, very much. And Marta Poszwad, who is, with, who is representing Google across uh, Europe and especially in Poland. Uh, we are so impressed with her reach and her network and everything she does for this great American company. As a frontline state, our friends in Poland are critical to the effort to build an international coalition of partners in Europe and elsewhere who see the threat of Russian aggression with clear eyes. An emphasis of the Biden administration 
has been Im the importance of close collaboration with our allies and partners, indeed rebuilding our alliances and partnerships across the world, but especially with our anchor here in Europe. One of our mantras has been nothing about you without you. And one Polish phrase I love to repeat around here is Zawasza wolność i nasza, for your freedom and ours. This approach has never been more important than now, as we witness renewed aggression against Poland's neighbor, Ukraine, by the Russian government. Indeed, Putin has now argued that Ukraine belongs to Russia, that Ukraine has no right to exist as a separate country. Putin has recognized two regions of Ukraine as independent states. Putin has asserted they are no longer part of Ukraine and its sovereign territory while authorizing the Russian military forces to deploy in those regions, which claim Ukrainian territory controlled by the Ukrainian government. As President Biden said yesterday, this is the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. President Biden announced that the United States is imposing sanctions in response. We developed those sanctions in close coordination with our allies and partners, including Poland. These sanctions go far beyond what we implemented in 2014. And if Russia goes further with its invasion, we will go further with our sanctions. As President Biden said yesterday, the United States and our allies and partners are working in unison. We're united in our support of Ukraine. We're united in our opposition to Russian aggression. We're united in our resolve to defend our NATO alliance. Let me give you assembled here today some recent examples of this close collaboration, focusing in this case on Poland and the United States. We have pursued broad, high level consultation and engagement with the Poles. Just at the beginning of this month, Polish Foreign Minister Zbigniew Rao led a delegation of senior Polish officials to Washington for the 2022 US Polish Strategic Dialogue which included consultations on our collective security. I took part in those and observed the genuine respect and consultation that our two chief diplomats have for each other. Earlier this month, Deputy National Security Advisor Ann Neuberger came to Warsaw to meet regional counterparts to discuss resilience against threats in the cyber arena. This is a brittle and vulnerable area. We are already seeing cyber attacks directed against Ukraine, including attacks that attempt to spread disinformation, implicating Poland. In the last week alone, we had visits in Warsaw from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin to the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee Adam Smith, and third, three very senior senators who are members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senators Kuhn, Sh Kuhns, Shaheen, and Durbin. The level and frequency of the interaction between the United States and Poland demonstrates both the importance of our relationship and the threat our alliance faces from Russia, and you will see that increase. While he was in Warsaw, De Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said, you know, it's ironic that what Mr. Putin did not want to see happen, what he didn't want to see happen, was a stronger NATO on his flank. And that is exactly what he is going to see going forward. And of course, President Biden has sent thousands of additional troops to Poland and other frontline states to reinforce NATO's eastern frontier. In the last week, I have visited with hundreds of those troops spread out across Poland in the, in, at the EDF in Eastern Poland, at Polwitz with the Secretary of Defense, 
and in other places. The United States continues to be in constant contact and consultation with our allies and partners on how to respond quickly and effectively to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The group of our allies and partners is a large one, but it is also a unified one. We are unified ne like never before in the face of this ongoing aggression, and we will not stand down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Brzezinski. We really appreciated having those remarks. Okay, now we ha are gonna move on to our moderated conversation. We are very lucky because this lady just flew in from Kiev and she's gonna give us a firsthand view. This is Oksana Anichparenko and she's the coordinator of the Ukrainian Endowment for Democracy. And she's the chief executive officer of uh, Go Global. It's an NGO that brings German, French, English speakers to Ukraine and helps people learn foreign languages. And she is a go-getter and all the good things that are happening in Ukraine, she has her finger on it. So looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, I think that these two gentlemen are not strangers to you. On my immediate right is Slo uh, Slomovir uh, Deminsky. He is the director of the Polish Institute of International Affairs or PISM. Really happy to see you. And then to my immediate right is um, <clears throat> uh, Wojciech uh, I, I'm terrible with Polish names, I'm so sorry, Konachinko, and he's the Deputy Director of the Center for uh, Eastern Studies, or OSW. It's great to have all of you guys with us. I want to start first with Oksana, since this is about Ukraine. So what's the mood like, and how are people feeling right now, Oksana? Look, it's uh, an emotional roller coaster because uh, we are expecting the uh, invasion happening each day. Um, Ukrainians have a great sense of humor, especially if you're living under the threat of war for seven years already. So we have now a new meme. It's like, you know, like you say sometimes, maniana. Like when are we going to discuss it seriously? Somebody would answer maniana. Now Ukrainians can answer, no, let's talk about that after invasion. I know that it's, um, I mean, that's how we try to handle what is happening because actually uh, it's, it's very tiring um, and uh, it's a mixture of anger and fear that you are living it all the time. You you have to think whether you uh, you should evacuate or you shouldn't. Um, if you are not evacuating, uh, you have to have your uh, tank uh, almost full, all, always full. You have to have cash, emergency bags. You are going to, for the weekend, I, I just did my first aid courses, for example. Lots of my friends are doing territorial defense courses. Um, somebody evacuating their families. So, I mean, it's crazy. It's like you just lost your ability to plan and you live your life. And it's it's freaking us out, I must tell you. So it's it's both scary, but also it makes us so anger, so angry. So there's a new poll from the Rosimkov Center that says that 45% of Ukrainians will fight and resist if Putin invades further. Do you think that number is accurate? Is it low? What, what, is it about right? What do you think? Um, I think uh, I think the ones who answered, the, the, yes, they are the ones who definitely uh, think that they are going to fight. I think that general probably numbers can be even higher because you never, it's not that you, you, you want to fight, you're... It, it's very difficult actually to understand what you're gonna do in the situation and a number of people are still trying to understand where they find themselves uh, in this situation. So, but I must tell you frankly, the majority of my friends that I, were, that we're having, we are prepared to stand, uh, to stand and uh, fight back. And um, I'm flying to Kiev like straight from from Warsaw, flying back because I can't miss that. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's a it's a huge actually. It's a very difficult to to make this decision. What are you gonna do if? or what are you going to do when, and um, a number of people are the one who decide to stay, they are staying because they are prepared and because they do know what they're going to do. Super, super. Gentlemen, so yesterday President Biden just announced new sanctions on Russian banks and on sovereign debt. Uh, I'd love to get your reaction. Uh, let's let's start with, with, um, with Slavomir. Was this enough? Is this going to deter Putin? What more should we be doing that we're not doing? 
well, I don't believe that uh, sanctions um, um, play an important role in, in Putin's calculus uh, and decision-making process. They are important as a, as a signal of unity, as a, the process of reaching this agreement, what we are going to do to deter uh, Putin is, in my view, even more important than the sanctions themselves. Because um, the process helps us to, um, to understand uh, the challenge ahead of us, um, um, to um, um, look for tools, what, what actually we, we can do together. Uh, because of course the sanctions have you know this to to age uh, um, um, problem um, they also are, are hard us and and the, the you know the, the tactics and strategy how to apply this instrument is particularly uh, um, important so the the process of consultations between uh, allies bringing all uh, um, on board explaining why we need to do this um, is is crucial and here comes to uh, you know uh, my last remark on that. Of course, Nord Stream two is symbolically a very important move, and the German government, and I would say even more, the Biden administration, which influenced the German government to do what actually was needed to do a long time ago, um, uh, should be, they should be priced. I mean, this this uh, are. Uh, our project was a symbol of uh, a kind of um, impotence of, of of the world. So everybody knew that it is bad idea. Everybody knew that it's undermined uh, um, um, ally solidarity. Uh, but uh, suddenly, uh, um, um, the picture was that um, uh, we can do very little to stop it. Finally, because of Putin, because his blunt violation of international law. Blunt uh, uh, attack on 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 peace in Europe. Um, uh, this uh, this decision was made, and, and that's great. That, that's that's great achievement. Slavomir, the debate now though is the sanctions that were put uh, in place are okay. You know, they're they're not super strong. There's more options. So in the expert community, we're having an argument. Should we throw everything at Russia now to tr try to deter them, or should we keep some of the sanctions in reserve? What do you think about that? Uh, I think, you know, you have to accommodate uh, European uh, approach to war and European approach to generally European strategic culture. And the European strategic culture is based on, based on the assumption that you have to uh, uh, leave uh, and call for dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, uh, it has been like this for ages. So uh, I think that on this continent we, we fought all possible wars and all for, for all possible reasons. So we know how to do it, really. And and the part of our culture is also uh, this: that um, uh, every everyone every war uh, needs to uh, you know find its its um, its end, and it's always uh, uh, diplomatic slash political end. So this, uh, you know, living these corridors for uh, dialogue is absolutely important for Europeans. We have different culture of, of conducting war than, than Americans, because Americans usually lead, you know, you know, they, they strategic aim is to reach unconditional surrender of, of, of the enemy everywhere, uh, starting from, from your uh, 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 19th century of, of your domestic uh, domestic war. So um, uh, all this culture, if if we want to have a common united front, all this culture have uh, have to be taken into account and and merge in one policy. Uh, and until now, I I have to say that uh, we should all we, we all should be happy that uh, the um, um, Biden administration, first of all. Uh, but also other allies were very committed to achieve this this unity, and our fist is really hard. Uh, now, uh, until now, uh, um, I believe that's uh, that's the kind of the political deterrence we achieved, which or, or in in overall our strategy to to deter Putin is important.
Great, thank you. Can I add on it? I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I just wanted to tell that um, from Ukrainian perspective, this time we do feel an amazing support of our international allies uh, because um, when the war broke out in 2014, we we heard, and we I'm so sorry, but we hated this phrase that uh, our European colleagues were and the uh, US were deeply concerned uh, about what were what was happening uh, in Ukraine. So now we do feel that the partners are united. Again, we do know that it's our fight and it's only us who will fight it. But it's um, it's much more comfortable to feel that you are that we have so many uh, partners that are united against. And I would also I would do um, agree with my uh, colleague um, that uh, uh, if you throw all the sanctions on Putin, he's already I mean he he's a little bit detached with reality and um, that's what scares all of us because he used to be rational we don't feel that he's so rational as he used to be so as as soon as you throw everything on him then you put him in the corner and there will be no other even way for like window for negotiations so i think that gradual sanctions and understandable with clear line of sight what can happen if I think that's that's a very strong uh, point. Yeah, I think that's an important point. We know from uh, several meetings that Putin has had recently that he doesn't want to negotiate. He wants to shout about Russia's historic grievances. He doesn't want to talk about off-roads. He doesn't want to try to find a diplomatic solution. So I think that's a really important point. Thank you so much for waiting. I would love to know, uh, what are we missing? What would you recommend that the West be doing that we're not doing now? No, definitely our uh, Western response is very different than what, what we observed in 2014, what Oksana uh, noticed. Uh, then it was very weak response. Now it's quite strong, I would say, what is, uh, uh, I think, a surprise for many, including Russia. Uh, let's, uh, let's remember that they started this military buildup around Ukraine in late October, hoping that uh, they, they will press us enough strong to have some concessions from both Kiev and the West, and they failed. So I think that the, the, the fact that they recognize the separatist republics, so-called republics in Donbass, is just a constellation price. Because from the very beginning, it's obvious that Putin is playing for to take over the whole uh, the whole Ukrainian state under under his control. The whole state. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that uh, what what is his uh, hope is that he would be able to to have uh, let's say. Uh, moderately, at least moderately, uh, loyal to Russia government in Kiev. Uh, and obviously it's, it's the, 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 the most difficult task now to predict what, we can, what can happen. Uh, myself, I honestly speaking, don't see too many positive scenarios. It's rather a question about how bad it will be. Uh, even if uh, I'm on the same page as Ukrainian government, and I think that the uh, full-scale escalation or full-scale invasion uh, along the, the, the Ukrainian-Russian border is still not the most probable scenario. It's on the agenda, by, but I think it's not on the top of the, of the agenda. But nevertheless, the escalation around Donbass, it's a question of, it's, it's already going. Russian troops are moving to Ukraine. Let's say officially now, because they are there, let's remember about that, that they are there uh, since 2014. So they are, they are that, uh, more and more Russian troops is moving to Donbass. So just a question of escalation is a question of, of, of time. Plus, I think it will be a, a hybrid uh, uh, response from Russia. I mean, military escalation plus uh, hybrid uh, attack, including cyber attacks, plus uh, attempts to destabilize the Ukrainian economy. For sure. So uh, I, I'm one of the analysts who's been arguing that Putin's going all in. And I get into big arguments with my colleagues at the Atlantic Council. I work with a bunch of former diplomats and they say, no, no, he's just trying to extract as many concessions at the table as possible. I don't think so. So let's try this on and, and, and you guys respond. I think the game plan is this. I think Putin's going to sit on the border. He's got 190,000 troops to the north, to the east, and to the south, and he's just going to menace the heck out of Ukraine for the next three to six months, and he drives the economy into the ground. He's going to continue to stir things up in the Donbass and keep pushing and pushing, and he's going to try to force the Ukrainians to sign a humiliating Minsk III agreement or, or something, uh, what, and maybe maybe push Ukraine to freeze its NATO aspirations for 10 years. I, I don't know what the terms of the agreement are, uh, I, I don't think he's going all the way into Kiev. What, what, would you respond? What do you think? Look, it's like um, playing guess games with Putin because uh, I think that he wants, I, I would agree with the colleague that he wants Ukraine. He just, he just, you heard his 
very interesting history lesson. Like very new for me. I must tell that I'm the winner of National Olympiad in History in Ukraine. And I I was did you learn anything? I, I I did, I did. Um I li I liked his uh, sources that he read. Uh so um I mean he has irrational uh feelings towards Ukraine and towards Ukraine being independent and democratic and free. So he will do the best in order to deter that uh, I think that now he's moving uh, like you know like in negotiations you have this salami salami type of negotiations when you cut piece by piece by piece by piece and then you take some time and let the world forget that I mean it was ours and then he goes further and further and um, uh, I agree with you that we do have a huge troubles now with the economy because because of the um, uh, blockade on the south we have uh, problems with our agriculture uh, we have problems with uh, I mean so we have the whole number of, um, of problems that we don't feel right now though now we're spending lots of money just to uh, to keep our currency uh, stable uh, like uh, during the last uh, escalation in a week time we spent three billion dollars just in a week time to keep the currency there so um, and we had billions of dollars pulled out of Ukrainian economy so but it, it's again it's we don't have now the projection that like microeconomic projection for half a year or a year term and the one who who is doing it, the people who are doing it now, saying that it looks like very very bad. So you're right about the economic uh, instability. And I think that Putin will go. He, he will go as uh, as far as we let him go. We and both West let him go. So it's no way. I mean, it's not that you can't predict, but you just have to be he has to understand that we will stay stay firm and tight and will protect uh each and every piece of our land that you that europeans and americans uh, the world is standing tight and he will get hurt but unfortunately i don't think that he's afraid of getting hurt i don't think that he somehow has his contingency plans on the economy how it affects them i think that here is more irrational for him is now playing and i think that he believes that he can get concessions from west and from ukraine Gentlemen, is he going to go for Lviv? Is he going to go past the Dnieper, Slavomir? Well, I I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I you know I'm dealt with him for twenty years, so um, still I don't know what's up, what he's up to. Nevertheless, I think that uh, after twenty years of following him, I I can say that now he's a very different person than he used to be twenty years ago. Um, I believe that um, now he simply seeks of hiding his uh, wrong, wrong givings. Uh, you know, even 2014, uh, he he invested a lot into kind of the um, smoke screen tactics. Um, um, propaganda, all these uh, polite people without insignia uh, running here and there uh, in Crimea and buying buying uh, machine guns in every store. So you know he was he he tried to invent a parallel uh, a parallel world in that time. Uh, now he's not doing this. He's uh, he's he's, he's uh, uh, perpetrating his his crime against uh, European peace on on the daylight, and he, first he he says what he's going to do, then he delivers. Uh, I'm afraid that he's you know now he simply wants to use a force. He wants to have his war. That's a kind of the uh, uh, you know uh, um, here's a very important point. Uh, during the last 20 years, uh, um, he has done a lot to put Russian military on its feet. Uh, modernizing new equipment, new uh, procedures. And now in, 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 the, in, in the moment when he is 70, so he is an aging politician, uh, he simply wants to uh, see uh, results of his policies. Uh, and it's a kind of the psychological uh, uh, issue, which um, uh, leads me to the point that, unfortunately, the strategy of uh, let's uh, sit and wait when uh, Ukraine collapses is not for him anymore. 
he wants to see the results now. And uh, if, you know, he has been waiting for, for Ukrainians collapse in 2014, at least. Uh, for Ukraine surrender, for for you know Paris and Berlin pushing Ukrainians to, to to you know for surrender, and nothing like that happened. So now he simply tries to use another tactic. This is his moment. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, one of our scholars, uh, Fiona Hill at Brookings, says there's never been a better time for him to go in. And he sees growing NATO membership, right? It went from 58% to 62%. So more and more Ukrainians want to join. And Putin wants to do, he wants to stop Ukraine on, on his watch. Time is not on his side. Ukraine is moving in a westward direction. So I, 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 I think, you know, I, I have some reservations whether it's about direction of of, of Ukraine. I, I believe that he he really thinks about Ukraine as a part of Russia, uh, which actually um, appeared as an independent state due to the collapse of Soviet Union. Yesterday he said that actually Soviet Union equals Russian Empire. So you know, it doesn't matter. So Ukraine was stolen from Russia in the time of Russia's weakness. So now he's a kind of, of, of the time of, of, of revenge. I believe that because, because nobody wanted to give him a free hand on Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, recognize that Ukraine is part of Russia's sphere of special interest, now he wants to uh, approve all of us that Ukraine would be destroyed, would be ruined, and Russia would collect pieces uh, as its own part of, uh, of the heritage. I have a really obvious question. So last July, Vladimir, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin wrote a 5,000, 5,000 or 6,000 uh, 6, word essay, and it's a long historical rant, and it basically says Ukraine is not a real country, uh, Vladimir Zelensky is not the legitimate president, our Russia's historic lands sit on Poland. Or sit on Ukraine. Why didn't we believe him? Why does the West? Why is the West surprised every time when Vladimir Putin does something new? When there's I a think, new act? I of think aggression? nobody in Poland believed him. Why, why not? Not only in Poland, I think. But uh, but you know, but that's I, I would like to make certain point because you know, uh, uh, we have been telling our, our allies where Vladimir Putin uh, is going for years. For years, it's not the first time. We. Uh, raised first alarm in 2008, when he uh, uh, actually triggered war against Georgia. Uh, uh, we raised alarm about Nord Stream, Nord Stream 1. That it, the, all of that it undermines European security. And actually, I, I, I you know, uh, hundreds of times um, sitting on such panels in various capitals, People laughed at me that I am russophobic idiot, or in a paranoid, a, or paranoid that you know we we should not listen to them because uh, they cannot think about Russia in a rational way. So, uh, uh, um, I I don't want to say that you know we are so bright and and clever, but uh, really we were part of of this Russian. Uh, uh, sphere of influence, we know the signals and we hear what they are saying to us. Even if some, you know, uh, members of some nations, uh, you know, uh, are living in more uh, in in Quan, in some distance from from Russia, are unable to do that. If I may, um, I think there are so also positive. Uh, sides of the of the of the ongoing crisis. First is what Slavomir uh, noticed is the changing perception of what is Russia. So uh, we, in this part of Europe, we have this diagnosis many years ago because of different tradition and different uh, historical ties with Russia. So now I think that this, uh, this perception is shared also by our Western neighbors uh, uh, about what is Russia and what Russia is not, and about some uh, dangerous behind the Nord Stream 2, for example, or being too much dependent on Russian oil and gas. So this is the first positive uh, uh, point. There is other. I think that this crisis is fundamentally transforming European Union and the West as a whole. Uh, it's our understanding that there is no alternative for NATO, which is also our diagnosis. It was not shared by many uh, our uh, European Union uh, members, partners. Uh, uh, it's transforming also our approach about the energy security. It's not uh, only that this uh, uh, 
analysis here in Warsaw or in Tallinn or in uh, in Prague that uh, uh, we should be careful with uh, with Russian uh, with being too dependent on, on on Russian raw materials. Now you can hear it not only from the European Commission but also in Berlin, which is a huge change. Absolutely, point well taken. I, I was surprised yesterday when uh, the Germans revert, uh, reversed their course on Nord Stream Two. There, there is a big change. Uh, let me ask you: Is war inevitable? Is there any way to get Putin to stand down, or but by what he did yesterday in, in the Donbas, is, is it? You know, I'm not, I'm not Ukrainian, but uh, Ukrainians always repeat, and I think it's correct that the war started eight years ago, right? So there is already war. You are asking about the new phase of the war. I think the new phase of war is already started. This is the, this is the what we should understand now. Uh, the, the the open question is about the level of escalation. I'm uh, I'm my, my understanding is similar to what you said before about this uh, next couple of months when he will try to to have this mix of desk escalation, military escalation, plus some uh, economic pressure, uh, blockade of 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 Ukrainian seaports. What, what was the case a few years ago, a few few days ago also. Let's remember that ports, especially Odessa, partially also Mariupol, are Ukrainians' a window to the world for, for Ukrainian export. Uh, for two thirds of Ukrainian export is going through the Black Sea. So, you know, uh, when they would try to close the Black Sea for uh, for Ukrainian a trade fleet, it would be a huge uh, uh, boost, for, huge hit a hit for uh, for uh, for Ukrainian economy. So I think we should to we, we should to, to take into account, and also you know uh, our perception often is that uh, the Kremlin or Putin, the, the, those guys are. Uh, uh, strategically genius. Yes, that whatever what they are doing, it's it's you know it's master plan. I I'm not buying this this narrative. I think that they miscalculated in this crisis at the very beginning, and it's not, it doesn't mean that they are winning. The, the fact that he recognized the separatists is not a sign that he he's winning. It doesn't mean the situation is not dangerous. It's still very dangerous, and it's still a a, a possibility that there will be a a major war. But nevertheless, uh, I think that we still have some leverages to, to stop him and at least well, to show... Hold on. But explain that, because the West, from where I sit in Washington, our hand looks really weak. We have more sanctions that we can throw at them and that's that, and some defensive material. But uh, Biden has said he's not putting troops on the ground. Uh, your analysis, uh, you, you seem to think that we have a stronger hand uh, th th than, than it looks like from Washington. I'd love for you to explain that argument. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, we don't have too many instruments to influence Russia, uh, except of sanctions. But, you know, sanctions are very different. Russia is part of the world's economy. Uh, it doesn't mean that we we'll stop uh, buying Russian gas or oil uh, since tomorrow. But we have some uh, tools to hit Russia hard. And we, we have these weapons which we doesn't use yet. It's still in our possession. And, you know, uh, if, the, if Putin, uh, my last sentence, if Putin would like to, to go on a major war, there are some huge domestic domestic risk for him also. I think we should talk about that, but I would just challenge you and say sanctions are are not a magic bullet, and the Russians have six hundred thirty billion dollars in reserves. Would that money be cleaned out in a year? Probably, probably. But I think Putin has priced this in. I mean, that we can go back and forth all day about this. We don't know what he's going to do. Uh, there's an interesting article in the Economist uh, about the inner circle around Putin, and uh, almost everyone around Putin. It's about six guys. They're all former KGB. Uh, they're 68 years old, and they all reinforce each other. And the sanctions that we're talking about putting in place aren't going to hit them. If I may add, just uh, on what the colleague said. Thank you so much for for this answer about the war. Um, we are in the war, and I must tell you frankly that we are again back in the situation when each day starts with the news about how many soldiers have died yesterday. And this is, again, we are in the 21st century in the center of Europe, and I'm telling you that I'm waking up each day to the news of how many people died. So the war is imminent, the war is already there, the question is only about the scale. You had two fingers. Yeah, you know, I, I had two, two fingers because, in, in my view, this um, this scenario uh, that Putin can wait uh, until uh, Ukraine collapses economically um, is based on the assumption that it's, he still uh, can um, uh, um, conceptualize this, the situation and its it, its moves in a rational way. So. It's, it's better for Russia to wait until uh, Ukraine collapses. Uh, 
I have some reservations, you know, watching him and how he uh, um, um, how he delivers his political messages, how he treats his, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, cronies around him, you know, uh, something significant happened to this individual. I mean, he is, uh, um, I think he's under huge stress. Uh, those who follow uh, um, him speaking, you know, Russian, I mean, we are able to comprehend that, you know, uh, uh, this um, this politician, this this leader, president, whatever, uh, um, is under huge stress, and he's not certain. He's not certain of himself. He's not confident. He's not confident. He he tries to behave as if he's you know he knows everything. Um, and uh, last last issue. Can I can I quickly react sure. on what you said because I'm on the same page. Uh, and you know, uh, let's notice that any discussion about the the, the future is a discussion about his state of mind. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sure if he's unrational or he's rational. Is he mad or he's not mad? I'm pretty sure that he is anti-Ukrainian obsession. And in this sense, he's a parano par paranoid, and as to anti-Western obsession also, but I'm still not sure about his unrational, unrational behavior. It doesn't mean that military pressure should not be our basic scenario about the, the next couple of uh, weeks and months. That's right. However, we have, we have also been in mind that you cannot keep 200,000 soldiers on the ground uh, endlessly. You, ha you need to rotate them. And it's not only a not only question of rotation of troops. You have to maintain uh, hardware. And this hardware, in, particularly in these conditions, deteriorates quickly. So I've asked my military guys that question, and they they say, you can maintain that kind of force. They said it's magical thinking to think that he's going to have to rotate. Uh, look at what uh, the United States has done recently in some conflicts. If Putin wants to maintain them there, he can. And uh, a lot of analysts in the U.S. have been obsessed with mud. We've been watching, you know, is the mud frozen or not frozen? And uh, my military guys say, forget it, the tanks can roll in. You know, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but it's it's not decisive. Absolutely. Not but but still, you know, uh, uh, if if uh, if you put a um, couple of thousand people under tents, um, um, you know, um, they can spend um, two weeks, three weeks, maybe in the mouth. But you know, after that, you know, ever normal people would try to to find escape from from such an uh, even trained, even trained. Uh, the question is. Uh, how much of these troops en um, uh, masse against Ukraine are properly and and uh, uh, trained to the such conditions and real are real on on highest readiness? This readiness and it's it's not it's not assessment. You can read it in, in the books that you know uh, troops which stay in one place for too long simply lose their readiness. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And we have another debate as well. I, I don't know if you've, you're having this debate in Poland or in Kiev, but in Washington, we have an endless debate about how strong the Ukrainian army is. So it's obvious that the Russian military is much stronger, much larger. And Ukraine has a tiny navy and has a tiny air force. But the Ukrainian uh, armed forces have gotten much, much better since 2014. Can you say more about that? I think that, yes, you're right, that we are lacking the weapons, uh, the modern weapons and the whole um, strength of uh, um, uh, Russian army. I also think that uh, air is our biggest weakness and uh, we do have problems there. And of course, something that our army is dreaming about is uh, closing the sky for if something happens or not if when something happens and he starts uh, flying around. So to ask data to close the sky over, over Ukraine. Um, but I must tell you frankly that we have now, now several hundreds of uh, people who passed through the uh, through the war already because we also did the rotation and uh, so we have uh, the huge numbers of soldiers who's been there. We have a huge number of um, veterans who's been there and uh, who are also having guns and uh, I think that our army I, I not I think I know that our army is much more prepared than in 2014. It won't be the walk in the park for him, for sure. Uh, will it be uh, bloody? Yes. But again, we are totally different. And we are different in the perspective of experience, in the perspective of pr preparedness for this, in the perspective of we do know how uh, how the how to support our army also. So we've been there. 
we've been there. We fought back our territories. I don't, don't know if, whether you remember it. They took much more territories. Now they have only one third of, they, of what they had from the very beginning. So we've been there, we've done there. And if if the destiny is like that, we'll we'll do that again because what else we and, have? And the Ukrainians are much more motivated than the Russians. I, I don't think you can discount that. I mean, there, there's serious disparities on the military side. Uh, I'd like to come back to a, a point that you were making, and we didn't have a, a time to dig into this earlier. Uh, you said that there are real constraints on what Putin can do. There's, and I would say that, that the, the fear of an insurgency is one of the constraints. I don't think Putin will ever consider going to Lviv. I, I think the maximalist is going to be the Dnieper River because he, he, he remembers uh, the, the sense of uh, nationhood and insurgency in Western Ukraine and the geography changes. Um, you may disagree with that, but what are the constraints you see on Putin's behavior? There's a few cons constraints, uh, uh, both in Ukraine, inside Ukraine, inside Russia. Let me start from the first. Uh, it's not only resistance, uh, which is, you know, just a matter of time if, if there will be invasion. Uh, you mentioned the Ukrainian resistance in the Western, what is rest Western part of Ukraine today. But let's remember that Ukraine uh, has changed since then. So now the Ukrainian identity, strong identity, it's not only the Lviv region, it's also central part, it's southern part, and it's Kharkiv region. So the resistance what was eight years ago can be the case in Kiev and in Kharkiv region also. And the motivation of those people, Ukrainian people, to fight for their country is huge. Uh, all polls show it. And, you know, this constraints in Russia, I think that the reaction from the Russian society in case of a full-scale invasion is still a question mark. Uh, we, are, we understand that they are under the, f the, 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 the uh, influence from the Russian, uh, Russian propaganda, Russian media. But, you know, even being in contact with some of my colleagues uh, living in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg in the last couple of days, I see that. And, you know, they are obviously part of this liberal bubble, let's say. But nevertheless, what they learn from their neighbors and relatives, uh, they, are, they, they, are, they are afraid also. There is a there is a, 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 a this a, a fear of of a major war between uh, brotherly nations and also my, my last point is uh, about the reaction in case of a major war of the reaction of the, of the elite of the ruling elite is uh, everybody is going to agree with with, with Putin I, I'm not sure I'm not so sure but at the same time our knowledge about what is really going on inside is limited. And just a small, small comment. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, thank you so much for this comment. I think that Putin doesn't understand the Ukrainians now. I don't think he understands us. I think he doesn't feel the way how he united us in the, after 2013. I think he doesn't feel us the way. And I think this is something that also triggers him now because somehow he thought that we are more pro-Russian than we are really are. And I, th I feel that he feels that he's losing Ukraine. He's losing a touch with Ukraine. And he really do doesn't get it till the end. And I think that's an opportunity for miscalculation, right? A few weeks ago, we were talking about this British plot to install a pro-Russian leader in Kiev. And the, the name that they floated um, was... Mariev, a presidential candidate. It was ridiculous. The The response in Kiev was LOL. Oh my God, this man, you know, is a loser. He's never going to be the president. He also was shocked. <laughs> he, okay, so he wasn't part of the plan, right? He, I'm not sure, but I mean, the general reaction, you're right, within elites were like, what? Yeah. So that tells you how, but I think that it's an opportunity for them to miscalculate. They think they understand Ukraine better than they do. But to your point, Ukraine has massively changed since 2014. Yeah, exactly. And this was a good point that uh, Russians uh, uh, today and and and, uh, and in the past, they usually underestimate Ukrainians. And, you know, if you if you will uh, check the Putin's recent speech about Ukraine, you will notice that he will not talk about Ukrainian people, except of those living in the bus. No Ukrainian society there. Well, it's fake. There, there, there is no such thing as Ukrainian people, right? He, he's rejected it wholesale. OK, you've heard enough from us. It's your turn. Hello, my good people. This is a microphone, and we would love for you to come up and ask questions. Everyone's shy. Oh, please don't be shy. We have five minutes, and we would love to take a question or two. Oh, please come. Awesome. And if you could introduce yourself, Absolutely, that'd be great. Yes. Thank you. That's not my name. Micha Baranowski, uh, director of uh, German Marshall Fund um, in Warsaw. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting conversation. Um, 
my question would be actually to step a little bit outside of the next day, week, or month. Will he, want he, how far, Dnieper, Lviv? Frankly, those um, those conversations are, I'm not sure if they are as productive as, I wanted to ask actually um, you all about something we are, I think here as Warsaw strategic community are thinking, that this is perhaps finally the end of the era of a post-Cold War um, uh, hope that Russia can be brought uh, back into the fold. We moved from cooperation to some level of competition. Perhaps we are finally in the confrontation. Uh, we are awake to this. Um, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you of, you know, um, of the sort of, if you if you were to on the quickly come up with a vision that we are that we should be pursuing in the years to come, um, a, you know it used to be Europe, Hall, and free at peace. What what is it now? Um, and I would push you a little bit, if I may, for on the in a let's try to be optimistic at the very end of this, right? Um, is there a scenario that we can come up? Think of that we are actually stronger at the end, also with the within the you know perhaps reforging the alliance a little bit. At the end. So, uh, open question. Thanks. Great, thank you. Who wants to reflect on that? Go ahead. Well, I fully agree that the time of good weather um, has ended, and uh, uh, this is a watershed moment for Europe for transatlantic relations, and I would say also for the globe. Now I would like to, b to borrow the story from, from, from my friends who, who had the chance to talk to an um, Australian head of intelligence. So the guy told, told him that uh, the, the, the worst moment in, in Australian history was 1942, because uh, uh, in that moment, the uh, uh, in, uh, international system of security in Asia collapsed. And it collapsed because the uh, European system of security was in ruin. So actually, uh, we have to uh, understand that uh, um, now that's probably the, 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 the last moment when we have to properly arm ourselves. And that's the message to Europeans and to European societies. 2% GDP spent for defense is too, is too little. We have to start to think about 3%, 3%, 0.5, something like that. Uh, we have to also comprehend that, that the Americans uh, uh, would be over, can be overstretched. Uh, it means that uh, you know uh, dealing with two theaters of operations, Pacific and Atlantic, could be too much. There would be division to, uh, of, of labor between allies. So Europe should should be able to take care of for conventional uh, deterrence. Why American would still uh, stick to a um, uh, strategic multilayer uh, 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 nuclear one? Yeah, uh, just just two sentences. Fully agree with Slavomir. Um, you know, this is a huge test for uh, for uh, for the Western uh, Western community, and I think that until now we are passing this test quite positively. What is a, what is a, also a, a, a good me message? But obviously, it's not the end of, of, of this crisis. But uh, what is at stake? It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a future uh, uh, architecture, a security architecture in this part of the world. You know, basically a, a legal based international order. It's not only about Ukraine. Let's understand it. You know, perfectly that it's not only crisis about the future of Ukraine. It's it's much 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 broader. Absolutely. You know, when you uh, you ask to think broader and to think further than the next days uh, or uh, years, I have one, it's a rational picture, but it's something that probably we are dreaming of. We have lots of actually Russians uh, in Ukraine now in Kiev, and um, they have this amazing phrase that they life. They say that Russia would свободна, that Russia will be free. So I think that sooner or later Russia will be free, but the key to free Russia is a free democratic Ukraine. So I think that the future future um, world order that we are going to is to have all of this part of the world democratic and freedom. And again, I think that if Ukraine has to pay the price to change Russia, we will do that. 
Super. I'd like to thank all of my panelists. This was a really interesting discussion. And now I'm going to ask you to return to your seats and hold tight for one second. Ben Haddad, our senior director for uh, Europe, has just arrived from Paris, and he is my great colleague. Ben, the floor is yours for closing remarks. Thank you uh, uh, so much, Melinda. First, apologies to everyone, as I was supposed to be on the panel, and I really want to thank my colleague, Melinda, for uh, replacing me as the moderator. My uh, plane had a mechanical failure, so we had to change planes, and here I am two hours late in, uh, in Warsaw. But it's really great to, uh, to be back and to uh, see uh, uh, friends and partners of the Atlantic Council. I want to thank also all the panelists for this great conversation. Uh, Marta Poslad and Google, our friend, for hosting us today uh, on their campus. Uh, you know, the Atlantic Council was founded 60 years ago with the mission of promoting U.S. engagement with allies, promoting the transatlantic relationship, of course, NATO at its core, and uh, supporting liberal democracy against authoritarian regimes. And if there may have been debates at some times in history, maybe in the 90s and the 2000s, about the importance of our mission, there clearly isn't any uh, today. And I think it's it's as critical, if not more critical, than ever to keep that strong uh, transatlantic bond as we're discussing renewed Russian aggression uh, in the support for the Ukrainian democracy and Ukrainian uh, people. We'll be talking a lot in the next few weeks about how we can best support uh, Ukraine uh, against uh, Russian aggression. Of course, there's the question of sanctions, there's the question of weapons delivery, economic support, anchoring Ukraine to Euro-Atlantic uh, institutions. Um, but I think, and that's what we were discussing just right now in the last few seconds of the panel, uh, I think we also need to have a longer-term conversation about strengthening and rearming Europe. Rearming Europe intellectually, which is understanding how to uh, think in terms of uh, power politics, but rearming uh, concretely. Uh, and I completely agree with what you were saying, Slavomir, in terms of uh, increasing defense spending. Uh, doing it with, uh, of course, within NATO uh, and arming and, and strengthening the European Union as well. I think it's really critical uh, in the next uh, in the next few years. Um, with that, um, I uh, I also want to just add that uh, uh, Poland is of obviously core to uh, to the Council. We will relaunch our operations soon in the, in the next few months with a new director uh, and a new team here probably uh, around spring, uh, if uh, travel allows. And you'll see uh, some of the member of our American team also here uh, in Warsaw. So we're looking really forward to engage uh, more with all of you in the coming months uh, and, and years. And with this, let me um, introduce a great friend of the Atlantic Council who's been very engaged with us uh, in the last uh, year, Deputy Foreign Minister Marcin Pshidash, uh, who will close this uh, great conversation. And uh, here's to you, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister. Come to this critical situation due to the Russia uh, proper escalation of tensions in and uh, around um, Ukraine. However, the situation we are facing is not the result of a, a single event, but of months uh, of a months-long process of uh, mounting tensions and showing instability in the region, not only with the use of the uh, military but also with uh, hybrid measures. Um, we've been witnessing the gradual deterioration of the situation in Donbas throughout 2021, as well as growing military buildup 
of Russian troops uh, gathered east and uh, south from Ukraine, including the illegally annexed uh, Crimea. What Russia is uh, proceeding with is the largest deployment of troops since the World War um, the second the decision of Russia to recognize this uh, self-proclaimed republic situated on the territory of Ukraine, the so-called Donetsk uh, People's Republic and Luhansk uh, People's Republic makes the bad situation even worse. Um, and it's uh, violating the international uh, law and, in fact, nullifying the Minsk uh, agreement. Uh, this is a part of the scenario of gradual escalation and aggression. Therefore, our response... Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, okay. Um, uh, uh, the, the, as I said, this is a part of scenario of gradual escalation and uh, uh, aggression. Therefore, our response should be fast and um, decisive. Weak or lack of response will embolden Putin to further hostile actions. It means we have uh, no, uh, have not learned lessons from 2014. Uh, military integration of Russian Belarus accelerating in 2021 is another challenge that the West has addressed as a factor which will stay with us uh, for long. It is not only about the intensification of the military cooperation drills, um, especially unprecedented deployment of 30,000 troops from the uh, Eastern Military District. We must uh, um, all be aware that uh, Russian troops uh, present currently in Belarus will be officially uh, stay there, uh, as it was said, as long as uh, necessary. Uh, now we have to treat them as a constant element of the security environment in the, in the direct vicinity of uh, NATO borders. Um, uh, the fact that significantly changes the strategic situation more from Ukraine, but what is uh, uh, equally important is from uh, NATO. It should be considered a, a serious shift in the security conditions in, in the region, affecting, as I said, not only Ukraine, but also NATO Eastern flank member states. Um, it also should be taken into account both in our threat assessment and planning. Analyzing the whole in the Russian activities over the last period, we also have to note that the uh, latest strategic nuclear exercising involving the launch of missiles, including um, hypersonic. Uh, the timing, of course, is not a coincidence. This is a clear political messaging with the most lethal military means in order to intimidate uh, the West and deter from delivering assistance to uh, Ukraine. We may not ignore the fact that Alexander Lukashenko watched the drills alongside Russian uh, President uh, um, Vladimir Putin at Kremlin, yet another signal of close cooperation in the military sphere, including its most uh, uh, fragile uh, layer. As I mentioned at the beginning, Russia uh, makes uh, use of uh, the full spectrum of uh, measures to escalate the tension and uh, the civilized situation in our region. Poland, together with Lithuania, faced a very serious hybrid attack with use of um, uh, migration. We have to take into account the high risk that this spring, the hybrid threat, may be back uh, on our borders with a crystal clear aim to further escalate the crisis. NATO policy on deterrence and defense always responds to the level of uh, threats the um, alliance uh, uh, faces. In light of recent developments, it is evident that NATO should be adapted and strengthened. The, uh, this crisis has confirmed again how important the uh, transatlantic link and the U.S. military presence, both conventional and nuclear, is for the security of our continent and that uh, our region as a indispensable sign of deterrence. Uh, as a first step, some allies have recently decided to deploy additional troops in the um, eastern flank. Uh, we welcome the deployment of the U.S. and U.K. soldiers on Polish uh, soil as a sign of solidarity in face of crisis. NATO allies decided to deploy land forces on a bilateral basis to increase the military uh, contingents within the enhanced forward uh, 
uh, presence and to enhance air policing. Within the NATO response force, uh, the U.S. put in readiness uh, 8,500 uh, soldiers on its territory. Then Spain and the Netherlands declared their uh, vessels to demonstrate NATO's presence at sea. These deployments can hardly be seen as offensive. Russia, is, uh, or Russia still maintains multiple regional advantages and advantages in terms of uh, uh, missile um, coverage, a ratio of forces, or uh, their levels of readiness. Uh, let's be frank, no matter how this crisis ends, uh, NATO will be in a new strategic situation. Russian and Belarusian military integration has advanced, and Russia has demonstrated the ability to concentrate large forces on its own and Belarusian um, territory. Therefore, the, uh, the NATO posture, including on the eastern flank, should be further enhanced in the mid and long term. The new uh, NATO strategic concept to be adopted at uh, Madrid summit uh, in June this year is a good opportunity in this regard. It should define NATO further political and military adaptation uh, to the degraded uh, European um, security. What is also needed is the close uh, cooperation with the European Union. We all must speak uh, uh, with one voice. Yet the role of the EU should be to reinforce actions taken within NATO and OECD um, framework, with particular focus on ensuring the coherence of the Western response to Russia. At the current state of crisis, this is a uh, high time to take the decision on uh, sanctions that the EU can apply as the, um, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine um, were violated. Uh, I know that we've taken already a decision yesterday um, together with our American friends, but in uh, our, uh, our opinion is, or our position, Polish position is, that uh, um, uh, those sanctions should uh, uh, be much uh, stronger um, and should hit uh, also additional other um, sectors of the, the Russian um, economy. Uh, additionally, the EU can use its strength by enlarging its assistance through a number of the EU external action uh, instruments. The EU should step up its um, support to Ukraine's um, uh, resilience. Poland, as a strong supporter of the two-track approach, Deterrence and dialogue has launched in the capacity of the OEC um, the renewed European security dialogue. We've proposed to the OEC uh, participating states to focus on three uh, thematic areas. First, strengthening of confidence and security building measures, including issues related to military transparency, risk reduction, uh, incident prevention. The second, conflict prevention, as well as uh, conflict resolution. And the third, uh, non-military aspect of uh, security. There is a question is, however, how to handle this process under current uh, circumstances, keeping Russian aggression and its total contempt for the international law and agreements. Moscow is a uh, party too. I would say that it's never too late for uh, diplomacy, but the talks with uh, Russia uh, are at a different um, phase uh, now. We don't really know whether Russia is really um, uh, still interested in uh, holding those talks, I mean, um, those diplom diplomatic efforts, uh, or they were just trying to um, um, distract us, uh, uh, preparing for the, uh, for the military activities we've been observing um, uh, recently. And, um, and I, 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 unfortunately, I believe uh, that it's not um, over. The rebuilding of confidence that is a necessary prerequisite for the constructive dialogue with Russia that once again, after Georgia and Crimea, aims at controlling a sovereign part of a neighboring state seems to be impossible in the near, near future. Transatlantic community stands united on our core principles. We must maintain this unity and speak with one, vo one voice uh, when our common security is concerned. We cannot accept proposals which de facto aim uh, at uh, rewriting under military threat international law and the foundation of, um, of European stability. We cannot accept the violation of territorial integrity of a sovereign European um, uh, state. 
Um, it was um, Georgia you know, first, uh, now it's Ukraine, and later on, uh, it will allow them to do that. Um, of course, they may, they, they may, I mean, the Russians, they may put a question mark, the sovereignty uh, of the, or, or the integrity of other European and the Euro, European states in the future. Um, at this time of, uh, this, this times of, uh, of trouble, um, uh, what really counts are values, confidence, and solidarity. We are convinced that our transatlantic community, our transatlantic ally, alliance will prove um, successful again in ensuring the security and the stability of our um, the continent. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that among friends, uh, pro-Atlantic Atlantic, uh, Council is uh, absolutely uh, the, one of the most important uh, um, uh, um, uh, think tank when it comes to the uh, transatlantic dia dialogue and is playing a, 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 a crucial uh, role in enhancing this um, uh, debate. I can, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you will continue your um, uh, important uh, work with regard to keep the transatlantic uh, um, uh, unity uh, and the uh, possible um, answer to those. Uh, um, threats in the uh, threat uh, way of uh, unity and solidarity. I thank you for your attention um, once again, and uh, once again, let me apologize that I cannot be with you and my friends in person. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ben.